I'm here to share an idea that will help you change the world. Whether that's a massive global problem, like climate change, or a massive personal problem, like getting out of a tough relationship, or even giving up smoking, this idea will help. The problem about problems is that it's easy to be frozen about addressing them. For example, if one thinks about the horrendous consequences of climate change, with ever more catastrophic floods, droughts, famines, refugees, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and give up. On the other hand, when people tell us that we can save the world by switching off our phone charger, it sounds just so trivial, it's not believable. So, some years ago, I discovered a technique um, developed by an organizational psychologist, Edgar Schein. Um, and he's an emeritus professor at MIT. And this idea is a really powerful way um, for helping people and organizations change. And I realized that this was just as applicable for helping people embrace difficult challenges like climate change. What Edgar Schein pointed out was that if we are to change, three things need to be in place. Firstly, we need to be absolutely convinced that change is needed. Otherwise, we won't bother. Secondly, we need to connect really personally to care. Otherwise, we'll leave it to somebody else. And thirdly, we need to feel psychologically safe to change. Otherwise, we'll just get stressed up about it. If these three preconditions are in place, we will change. If they aren't, we won't. So, to illustrate it, I'm going to share my personal story about how I came to embrace the challenge of climate change. It feels like I've known about climate change forever. When I was an engineering student here in Cambridge, uh, not at Newnham, no. Um, I, my, my student project was developing solar panels. My first job was inventing these very innovative, newfangled um, condensing gas boilers that are now absolutely standard. A few years later, I got my dream job as a professional inventor and technical consultant. I remained interested in the environment, and I would really have liked to have worked on stuff to help with climate change. But by this stage, it was the 1980s, and the 1970s energy crisis had gone away, so there weren't very many opportunities around. So I got on with my job, and I had fun inventing things for clients all over the world. So I have a question for you. How many of you feel that you're in this similar position to the one I was in? You're aware about climate change. You're concerned about it, but you're getting on with your life. And if you're honest about it, you feel you're probably not doing as much about it as you really ought. So hands up if you think you're in that position. Well, I would reckon that's at least 90%, um, maybe 99% or 100%. This is really common. Surveys show that it's about two-thirds of the UK population are in this position. It's as if we're frozen. So, for me, things started to change um, in the 1990s. At the time, I was developing Braun's cordless gas hair styler. Initially, my prototype worked perfectly. It heated up rapidly to the perfect temperature, and it stayed there, and I could turn it up, and I could turn it down. And then I made a tiny change to one component and suddenly it had passed some sort of hidden tipping point, and it became unstable. And apparently at random, it would heat up far too much and damage the hair, or actually it would be too cold and it wouldn't work properly. I was getting very frustrated with this. And at this time, I went to a talk at the Scott Polar Research Institute here in Cambridge, and I saw a graph that really shook me because of the parallels I saw with what was happening to my hair styler. And this, roughly speaking, is the graph that I saw. So what it shows is the temperature um, and the, it shows the analysis of the bubbles of gas trapped in ice, in ice cores from Antarctica and Greenland, going back hundreds of thousands of years. And on the right-hand end you see today, and as you come back towards the left-hand end, you see 
hundreds of thousands of years earlier. And the blue line is the carbon dioxide levels in these little bubbles of, of gas that are trapped in the ice. And the red line is the temperature of the air at the time the gas bubble was trapped, which they can work out. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that the red line and the blue line are sort of going up and down together through the ice ages. And I'm not sure if I'm allowed to step off the stage, but, but if you go to the middle here, um, this point here, that's roughly speaking when Neanderthals invented fire, or rather started using fire. And if you look at the far right-hand end, you can see that the blue line seems to be going straight up. That's the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere. Where it was in 1990, and where it is today, is higher. It was at 360 in 1990, it's now at 407. This scared me. Honestly, it scared me. And because as an engineer, I saw the parallels with my hairstyler. And what it made me realize is that climate change isn't just going to be about a bit of gentle warming. It could be quite nice. But we're heading into tipping point territory. And at best, what we could see is just quite a lot of weird weather. At worst, if we don't stop what we're doing, we could have complete climate chaos. As an engineer, I had now reached the point of Shine's first precondition. I was 100% personally convinced that we needed to stop what we were doing. We needed to put less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But still I carried on with my life, enjoying um, um, my, my, my career, flying all over the world. The evidence on its own was not enough to make me change. Over the next few years, it started to get me. In part, this was the personal realization that my flying was my biggest personal contribution to the problem. But it was also a growing sense of anxiety as I began to realize that it would be a shock to my, to my, my self-image as an intelligent, rational, moral being if many years from now people said to me, but you knew, why didn't you do something about it? Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> I connected. I cared. It was personal. But I didn't make any real changes. I just remember it as being a really unhappy time in my life. However, the years around the turn of the millennium were momentous for me. Most noticeably, I met my future husband, Tom. He shared my concern about climate change. I felt supported. We could take risks together. And uh, this was the third of Shine's preconditions for change. I felt, I felt supported, I felt safe to change. Within a few years, we'd got married, got a house together, and over the next 15 years, we reduced our carbon footprint um, by 80%. In retrospect, it seemed so obvious. We insulated the house, here's me, clad up, insulating the loft. We stopped wasting energy. We thought carefully about where we go on holiday. We stopped commuting. I now have a rather nice office above the kitchen. And we are pathologically fixated on switching off lights in rooms that we are not in. At the same time, um, I moved on from my technical consultancy career of the last 25 years, and I set up my own business um, concerned with organizational change and creativity. Now that I was the boss, I decided that I was going to stop flying and I was going to focus on working for clients within two hours of home. Oh, and I chose a green logo as a statement of intent. And during this time, I got involved as part of the core group that was setting up the big climate coalition of all the NGOs, UK NGOs, that care about climate change. Our mission was to demonstrate a public mandate for political action on climate change. And collectively, um, the Climate Coalition has currently, I think, 16 million members. We organize lots of big demos. 
and many of you here may have been on some of them. And th in 2008, that brought in the UK's groundbreaking Climate Act, which in a world first was the UK government setting legally binding targets for future governments to reduce carbon emissions by 80%. And most importantly, not just a target, it was also setting up the mechanisms to actually help make that happen. And this Climate Act has since been replicated in other countries around the world, including, I heard the other day, Papua New, New Guinea. <laughs> so, me embracing the challenge of climate change hasn't solved it, of course. I still remain very anxious about its impact on younger generations. But it has made a huge difference to how I feel about it. Now, if, in future, somebody asks what I did about climate change, I will be able to hold my head up and say, I really tried. My call to you is, many of you um, put your hands up earlier, virtually all of you put your hands up earlier, saying you thought you ought to be doing more about climate change. Maybe you have other important challenges in your life where you have that horrible, nagging feeling that you're ignoring something important to you. My call to you is, don't ignore that feeling. But think, which of Shine's three ingredients do you need more of? Is the problem in your head? Is it that you need more evidence that change is needed? Is the problem in your heart? What would make you really connect? Or is the problem about support? What would make it feel safe for you to try? If you can get the balance of those ingredients right, you will find you have embraced your challenge. And the nice thing is, um, as you start to address it, you will no longer feel like a helpless victim. You will feel a sense of agency, of power. And as you start to share what you're doing with others, you will help them change too. And then together, you will find you are changing the world for the better. Thank you.